Okay, I am going to uh, try and start. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, here in the room and online to our second colloquium in our series on philosophy and the mental health act. People in the room are very excited uh, to do something in person, uh, but nonetheless, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, this is the uh, uh, second in a series of events exploring philosophical aspects of the Mental Health Act and psychiatry in general. We have two fantastic speakers here today to talk about communication in young mental health clinical encounters. But before I want to introduce uh, the panel, I just want to thank the Salby Foundation for supporting today's events and the rest of this series. And I want to invite everyone uh, to have a look at us. Um, we will organize more events so you can sign up for a newsletter and the links for this should appear in the chat. Um, so we're going to have about 45 minutes talk. Then we'll have a very brief uh, comfort break for glasses of water and similar. And then we'll have a, a Q&A. And you know, we'll, we always try and include both the online people and the people in the room in the Q&A. So with that, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce uh, Professor Lisa Bortolotti, who's a philosopher of, co of cognitive sciences, focuses in, oh, I just can't talk sometimes, focusing on a philosophy of psychology and psychiatry at the University of Birmingham, and Dr. Clara Bergen, who is a research fellow at the City University of London, Division of Health Services Research and Management. Dr. Bergen researches interpersonal communication in healthcare setting with a focus on sensitive topics of conversation, including behavior change and mental health. And um, yeah, I'm really interested in this, so I'm really excited to have you here today. Uh, so uh, welcome, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. Um, it's exciting to have some people in person today and some people online. I'm really happy that, you know, to be back semi in person with those of you that are here today. Um, I'm here with Lisa. We're presenting on a project that has been ongoing for about two years, uh, titled Communicating in Youth Mental Health clinical encounters. Here today, we will be introducing the A Gentle Stance. Um, I, I'm going to acknowledge our co-authors and collaborators in a moment here, but below you can see a list of names, our website. Please feel free to take a screenshot, write it down. Um, let's see if I can change slides. Um, so actually, the first thing that I want to do before I get into things today is to start with a content warning. So we will be presenting on some distressing themes and data. So I don't know everything that went out in the email, but we will be looking at, um, we'll be reenacting clips from videos. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll be reenacting clips from videos where um, people have presented to the emergency department with thoughts of suicide. So if you do feel uncomfortable at whatever point, please feel free to step out of the room and do prioritize your own well-being because this material can be really, really distressing. With that said, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our funders. So in the UK, so we have been funded today by the UK Research Council, Economic and Social Research Council, and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And I would also like to acknowledge the young people that have been collaborating with us and um, supporting us throughout this research, as well as the patients and practitioners that participated in the initial study that kind of was the jumping point for this study involving video recording of psychosocial assessments for self-harm and suicide. So what we are presenting today is the outcome of a team collaboration involving two groups of researchers. So first, we call the Interdisciplinary Academic Research Team, or IAR. That is a group of six academic experts in philosophy, psychiatry, psychology, clinical communication, clinical practice, and public involvement in research. So those are some of the names that you see here. And the second group of researchers consisted of five young people aged 17 to 25 with personal experience of receiving mental health care. So we're going to refer throughout the talk to this group 
as the lived experience researchers or YLER. Um, we worked with the McPenn Foundation, which is a great resource for academics who are interested in working with people with lived experience of mental health, um, of mental health treatment. Um, and we highly recommend working with them to other academics. Um, so both groups, both YLER and IAR, collaboratively analyzed clips from video recorded psychosocial assessments from between emergency department psychiatric liaison teams and people presenting with self-harm and suicidal ideation. So for context, the ED psychosocial assessment involves an assessment of needs and risks for someone who's presented with self-harm, leading to a care plan involving recommendations for community-based services, referrals to outpatient care, and if relevant, hospitalization. Patients presenting with suicidal ideation or self-harm were approached by a professional in the waiting room and assessed for capacity to give informed consent. Um, sorry, I just, I do want to go through all this before <laughs> we get into the kind of more fun stuff. And a three-step consent process was developed with a panel of lived experience experts and two GoPro cameras were placed in the assessment room and no researcher was present. So a part of what I think we're excited to share today and explore with you guys is that we took a sort of novel inductive and iterative approach to data analysis. So the YLER and IAR held data sessions in which they would watch and analyze these videos in groups. And two members of the IAR with expertise in conversation analysis, so that's where my expertise is, um, asked prompting questions. And these prompting questions focused on things like the observable features of the interaction that they were watching, the contextual factors and socially informed understandings of what they were seeing, and the YLER's members' perspectives on what they were observing and how they saw this through the lens of their own personal experience. So these meetings were then audio and audio recorded transcribed and while ER analysis was then fed back to IAR and vice versa, informing the identification of themes and selection of subsequent video clips. Yes, so um, I think it's really important uh, that we introduce uh, the methodology that we've used because um, otherwise you'd seem quite difficult to understand how we get the themes that we're going to talk about from uh, the transcripts that we're going to show you. Um, one thing that we started from is the idea of agency. What is the role of agency in these interactions? And I guess that's the link with the mental health fact conversations that you have had and you're going to have in this series. We are interested in what can support agency in people who are particularly vulnerable. Um, this is a population that is vulnerable in our context because it's young people um, that are, who are so distressed that they need to access emergency services. Um, so one thing that we needed to do because we were a group of interdisciplinary researchers and working with a group of young people who didn't have the same academic background as us was be very clear about what we meant by agency. Um, and we adopted a very kind of broad and non-technical um, notion of agency to work with. So we just uh, remarked how an agent has the capacity to intervene in their surrounding physical and social environment um, in order to pursue their goals and interests. So this capacity that a person has to um, impact on what is happening to them, give some sort of direction to their lives on the basis of what they want to do, what they want to achieve. But one thing that we really wanted to look at in the interactions between professionals and young people in distress was perceived agency. So how the interaction with the practitioner was changing the way in which the young person was feeling and thinking about themselves. Um, was the interaction empowering or was the interaction such that was threatening the sense of agency that a young person had? And that's why we also need to talk about sense of agency or perceived agency, which we treat indistinguishably. And the idea is that, um, you know, a person 
as a sense of agency if they feel they are an agent, if they feel they can intervene in the surrounding physical and social environment. Now, um, our sense of agency is not always the same. Uh, it changes depending on the situation in which we are and how we feel. So a person who feels helpless typically does not have a strong sense of agency. Someone who has been recently uh, a victim, someone who has been, for instance, abused, may feel that things are happening to them. They are not the ones making their stories. They are the ones kind of passively um, having to deal with the stuff that is happening around them. Someone who has, for instance, just successfully fulfilled a long-term goal, overcoming difficulties, may feel a very strong sense of, of agency, may feel that, you know, I've been able to do it. It wasn't easy. You know, I didn't always have support, but, you know, I've done this thing that was really important to me. And again, in our lives, I think we go from strong and weak sense of agency all the time. Now, what may be perceived as threatening agency in young people who have experience of mental health problems? I think there are some key factors and I can go through them only briefly here, but I'm, we are happy to talk more about them in discussion. The first point is that the young people we are thinking about, they are in a phase of transition in their lives. They may be changing school, they may be moving farther away from their families to think about their natural social environment being defined by their peers, for instance. There are a lot of transitions that are in process in their lives. So we're talking about adolescents, we're talking about young adults from 16 to 25. In addition to that, because these are people who needed help and presented to emergency departments, there was also an additional factor that they might have experienced distressing events that made them feel helpless or hopeless. Maybe their mood um, was particularly low. And in these conditions, their sense of agency might have been uh, additionally compromised. One issue that we have noticed is that very often, uh, and I think this happens for everybody, but it's more of a serious threat for young people. Our identity, uh, the way we think about ourselves, is defined also by the interactions that we are having with other people, especially when the other people in, in question are people that are important to us who, or have a power relationship with us. So, uh, for young people, you know, what their teachers think about them, what their parents teach, think about them, what their peers think about them, may be very important to kind of start and define the flux that is their identity. And the practitioner, you know, the way that the practitioner talks to them, the way the practitioner looks at them, makes a huge difference in how they feel about themselves. And unfortunately, we know that there are lots of negative stereotypes that are associated with young people in that particular age group. Um, and those stereotypes become layered with other negative stereotypes that are associated with people who have mental health issues. So for instance, they're often defined as restless, lazy, attention seeking, lacking maturity or experience or resilience. And for instance, in the press, you might, might have seen young people often being described as snowflakes, right? People who cannot take it, who cannot cope with adversities. Um, all of these negative stereotypes affect the way in which practitioners and everybody else deals with young people. It may be a, a factor to consider when we're thinking about the threats to perceive agency. So what we have done, um, on the basis of the process that Clara described to you, this iterative process, is identify um, some themes. Um, five are the themes that we're going to present today um, that characterize uh, the sense of agency that young people have and how the practitioner can act in such a way as not to further undermine uh, the young people's sense of agency. This involves uh, some aspects of agency and some things that the practitioner can do. Um, so one aspect of agency is the idea that an agent is a subject of experience and their perspective matters. Another one is the agent can take action to change their situation by seeking help. The third one is that an agent may have multiple and conflicting needs of an interest. Um, the fourth one is that with adequate support, the agent can contribute to positive change. 
And the last one is that with adequate support, the agent can participate in decision making. So what we're going to do next is going through um, the different things that practitioners can do or can avoid doing in order to um, respect this aspect of agency in the young people that they see. And Clara is going to start and talk about validation and legitimization. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think just one more point to make on this slide. We were really amazed how the YLER was able to really break down how they viewed agency within the context of these clinical videos. So how they would kind of pick apart these interactions with the practitioners and what they saw as missing and how they could relate that to their own life experiences, I think was just really powerful and surprising as somebody who hadn't done a lot of research with lived experience, like lived experience research, I was really, really impressed with how young people, you know, as young as 17 were able to really put this stuff into words. So these are their words. Um, and I just wanted to kind of highlight that. So um, I'm gonna start out here by talking about these first two aspects of agency. So an agent is a subject of experience and their perspective matters. And two, an agent can take action to help their situation by seeking help. So first off, we have validation. Um, the validation, we can define validation as a form of understanding and acceptance of another person's internal experience that is distinct from agreement or approval. This, to, to the practitioners, this was kind of a, an important distinction, something that they maybe wouldn't have thought about. Um, but the YLER recognized validation as largely missing from these assessments, since practitioners were so focused on asking questions and assessing risk. So to them, or to the YLER, this was undermining that first aspect of agency as we identify here. So an agent is a subject of experience that thoughts, feelings, perspectives matter. So communication practices that demonstrated validation were also identified, of course. So these included listening attentively, accepting the person's description of their experience at face value, showing empathy and avoiding judgment of what the young person had described as their own inner personal experience. While ER members described what they experienced when healthcare practitioners did not take a validating approach to conversations. And as described by one of the members, she, she I mean, I think she did a really good job emphasizing by bypassing these feelings. It's almost like telling the person, okay, your feelings are a problem. I am uncomfortable with your feelings and we're not going to talk about them. We're just gonna fix them almost amplifying the young person's distress because they're struggling to sit with those feelings and they're seeking help. Legitimization is a related but really distinct to the YLER. So while validation expresses a commitment to listening to, understanding and accepting a person's experience, legitimization to the young people was help seeking or was legitimization of help seeking to the young people was expressing that the young person made the right choice to seek help in the first place. So legitimization of help seeking underpins the second aspect of agency. The agent can take action to change their situation by seeking help. So I think one of the key themes that you're gonna see across these is that to the young people participating in this project, agency wasn't a solo activity. It was very much a collaborative social activity within the context of emergency mental health services. Um, so oops. an agent, um, just as validation was largely missing from these videos, we recognized that legitimization also was missing. So communication practices that demonstrated legitimization included treating the person as deserving of support, treating them as a right to have asked for help and as having a legitimate concern. This was actually surprisingly absent, treating the young person as having a valid, legitimate reason to be coming into the emergency department in the first place. Um, so the YLER emphasized the potential for negative impacts of treating the young person as though they do not have a serious concern 
or they do not really need help. We're going to see examples of this in a moment. Lisa and I are going to um, go through a couple of transcripts together. But as described by one of our YLER members, with this sort of interaction of, oh, it's fine, you're fine. You know, the department has said that it's not an issue and it's fine that you're having these thoughts. So therefore you would not be thinking, well, maybe this is really serious. Maybe I need to tell someone to help me. And you might not go back to seek help again because of what happened previously. So like I said, Lisa and I are gonna be reenacting a couple of these clips together. Um, extract one involves downplaying the young person's distress. So this is gonna involve both um, invalidation and delegitimization. So, just as a description, Jack is a young man experiencing suicidal thoughts. Obviously, that's not his real name. At the start of this video, he's going to say he feels miserable. And that's the, the thing that's going to be disputed in this assessment. All right, I'm going to play the young person and Lisa's going to play the practitioner. Um, I feel like miserable kind of sums it up. Um, and yet in your face, you know, yeah, um, when you're speaking, you are, you've got a variation, haven't you, of, of your expression. You know, you smile and things like that. Yeah. So you are at times when you clearly aren't miserable, you are sort of enjoying things mm. or you are able to give the impression that you are yeah. enjoying things. <laughs> no, we can give that a minute to let that sink in. Um, so we see here examples of what the young people would have called um, delegitimization and invalidation. So um, it's citing evidence of, so citing the evidence, you have variation in your expression, you smile as, as potentially reasons that undermine his narrative and his own description of his own feelings of being miserable experiencing this. And she even goes so far as to say that he therefore has times when he's not miserable, when he is enjoying things. And she, we see this kind of over and over again in these data where practitioners are pulling evidence from how the young person is presenting themselves and using that as, as evidence to assert this alternative characterization that is minimizing of their experience. Um, and yeah. no, no, of course, I'm not the communication expert here. So this <laughs> is just my impression as a lay person. But one thing that I've noticed in these transcripts and these videos over and over again is the forensic style of questioning of the practitioner. It's almost like, you know, she's trying find an inconsistency in what the person is either saying or doing right so you cannot say that you're miserable if you are smiling right that kind of uh, style of questioning which i found personally as a lay person not a communication expert very difficult to deal with in, in this in these videos yeah and in terms of the communication aspect it also makes it really difficult for a young person to push back on that alternate characterization of their own feelings because not only is a person in power asserting that, you know, you, this is not true, you have this alternate, you know, set of feelings, but there's this evidence to back it up. Um, yeah, so in contrast, we do have case two. So here's a case where the practitioner is going to acknowledge the young person's distress. And in this case, Sarah is a young woman presenting after a suicide attempt, and she has just described having very rapid shifts in her mood. It goes like this. You said it's kind of like something or nothing, but is it because you can't find the words to find? Or is it because there is literally no explanation that you just feel so different? Mm -hmm. One. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It'll just come over me. Like, I'll admit it. Sometimes I just can't, I just find myself changing and then I'll be down again. Yeah. And I don't know why. Mm. It sounds like it's quite exhausting mm -hmm. because it must sound like you almost don't know where you are from day to day, even then. I'm fighting like every day myself. Yeah. I'm so tired. 
in this case, this was one of the cases that the YLER picked out as particularly validating. Um, because of this demonstration of knowledge, this acceptance of her um, inner experience, and ultimately, um, ultimately kind of like describing back to her things, kind of using her own language to describe back to her things that she had reported about her own personal experience. And they felt that this was, this kind of was, is one of the building blocks towards agency, this like demonstration that the young person's experience and feelings were relevant and worth understanding. And therefore something that at a later point could be brought up and, and discussed. Yes, absolutely. No. And if you compare it with the previous extract, one effect of the forensic side that we see previously was that the young person stopped sharing information. They kept saying, mm, mm, that was the maximum uh, participation in, 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 the, in the conversation. But here, because there is the validation, there is the interest and the curiosity of the practitioner wanting to know more, the young person, as an effect, shares more of their experience. And so they're kind of providing even more information about how they feel that could be useful to the practitioner to determine the type of support that the person needs. Absolutely. And that's what we see across the whole data set. Even when we look at the other videos, you know, we, we have 45 videos if you include the adults. And um, it's, it's a really consistent pattern. Um, we've included these. these uh, we've used these in practitioners, in, in um, uh, presentations for practitioners. Um, these are the top tips written by the young people involved in the project for practitioners, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, just saying, I can see you're struggling, can make all the difference. Don't downplay what I'm feeling. I still want you to acknowledge my distress, even if you can't offer me services. That was actually a really surprisingly big one because I think in crisis care, there is this really heavy limitation of services. And so there, the young people talked about how often where you would see the least validation was in those cases where a person ultimately was going to be turned away. Um, and just because I look okay does not mean I'm feeling okay. I can tell if you're taking me seriously by your body position and tone of voice. Um, one last quote, and then I'm actually going to pass off to Lisa to talk about the other um, two of the other categories here. So you are really distressed you're in a lot of pain. One of the members of our YLER group said this, I think that that kind of acknowledgement alone can be really powerful for someone who feels like they're completely alone, isolated, and like they don't feel like they even have control over their own mind. So that's where I'll leave you and Thank hand you. over to Lisa. Thank you, Clara. So we'll just continue with the aspects of agency that we presented to you and move on to talk about uh, objectification. So what happens when the young person is not considered to have multiple and conflicting needs and interests, but just be something that can be managed easily. So uh, why is it important to avoid objectification and what do we mean by objectification? Uh, we talked about um, the agent as a subject of experience. So objectification is the opposite. It's treating the person as if and, you know, they don't have a particularly important experience to share, but they are an object that needs to be classified. They are something that needs to be understood. They are a problem that needs to be solved. And in a crisis team, you can tell that there is a strong temptation to think of the young person as a problem to fix because, you know, there is this risk assessment to be done and there is this kind of potential support to be offered to them. But clearly, the young person doesn't want to feel they are just a collection of signs or, and symptoms. So, um, for instance, they say when you're a young person, your identity is so malleable, it's very easy for a label to become enmeshed with your sense of identity. One obvious in implication consequence of objectification is labeling a person too early. And by that, we mean diagnostic labeling. So you see someone behaving in a certain way, it seems to fit a certain diagnostic label, you just uh, 
try and impose a label on the person because that immediately gives you a range of possible um, support and treatment option that you can offer, but you haven't really inquired yet about the person's experience, maybe there hasn't been validation or legitimization, and so you may get it wrong, uh, or you may do that too early, so we call that premature labeling. And it's very important that we're not talking about all diagnostic labeling as problematic because the young people really thought that diagnostic labeling can be incredibly powerful and helpful to them as an access to support. They just thought that being assigned a label prematurely before their experience has been listened to was problematic. So here we are in extract three, an example of putting the young person in a box, uh, so objectifying. Jack is a young man experiencing suicidal thoughts. And in this video, the practitioner labels Jack as non-suicidal. So we saw before the example with the miserable label, now there is the suicidal label. What happens here? This is the same video. Um, a fantastic yeah. practitioner, clearly. clearly. So what, what kind of plans would you have had this evening? I, it was. I got a few events on because I'm part of rugby, skiing, and tennis, and they all had different events on tonight that I would have gone to. I see. So, so we could safely say you're not going to end your life. Do something that would have... Uh, what, tonight? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have ended it tonight, no. Oh, you wouldn't have. Okay. So maybe there was a bit of miscommunication because they brought you here because they were saying that you were suicidal. And no, I am, but like I've got- You are. I've got, I, I feel like I can, I mean, I haven't done it yet. Okay, so I mean, it's uh, to let that sink in. So similar uh, adversarial style, forensic style. How can you say you're suicidal if you had plans for tonight? Um, clearly not recognizing that the person can have conflicting interests and feelings. They may, you know, thinking about ending their lives at some point, but they still want to go and see their friends um, that particular night. So very, very problem, very difficult to watch this video. I'm actually happy that we're just reenacting it yeah. for you because to watch it was really, really distressing. A completely different approach. Here, the practitioner is trying to see the old person. He's trying to put the person into a context of their life event. Um, so Dan is a young man presenting after a suicide attempt, and the practitioner treats his suicidal ideation as complex and grounded in many parts of his life. I think from what you have said mm -hmm. that you've been struck by a nut, and nut is a negative automatic thought. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is since you've left the army, which is something you succeeded to get in the army, you came out of the army, but you are in town, nothing much is going on, mm -hmm. and you can't go back. You're not going to the gym. Mm -hmm. Your physical exercise is going down, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's hard for you to get a job. You struggle with your mom because she doesn't understand the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you get this build up of negative thoughts in your mind. Yeah. Negative thoughts, negative thoughts. All of a sudden, what will happen is, what the yeah, heck, I'm opening yeah. up the medicine cabinet. I see them all. So you see here, clearly the person listened to what the person had to say about their experiences, their relationship, um, their interests, and put the situation into the right context and tries to give an explanation to the young person about why they might have got to the point of wanting to end their lives. So there is certainly much more engagement and, and a real conversation between them. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, the patient in the post visit interview that we were able to collect really talked highly about this kind of moment in the assessment. Yeah, so they said, I had no one to talk to, I had nothing. And then I spoke to him and the team, and they understood. They actually listened and understood what I was on about. He basically explained why I did it, attempted suicide. I didn't know until he told me. So just the fact of listening and providing a possible kind of explanation narrative uh, for um, the young person was incredibly important. So the interviewer asked, what was the most helpful part of the assessment? That they understood me, that never happened before in my life. No one has actually understood me. What would you do if you had suicidal thoughts again? Talk to someone first. I didn't do it. I talked to someone first. So a big thing is that when you, um, your, your, 
desire to seek help is delegitimized when they're telling you you're actually fine, you're not suicidal. Next time that you feel that you may be in a crisis, you don't seek help. And the young people talked about this a lot. And it was part of their experience. People stop thinking that you know it's worth engaging with a practitioner. Whereas if the person has had a good conversation, they felt understood, when they need help again, they will go and seek help. And I think something that we will talk about kind of throughout the rest of the assessment, or <laughs> the rest of our presentation is this concept that we kind of kept seeing over and over again with the young people, which was that agency was partly about connecting with people who could provide support and gaining agency when, when feeling in a suicidal crisis, feeling out of control, in part meant facilitating that kind of support in the way that you're describing here. Yeah. And the top tips for practitioners um, are, you know, again, from our young people, fully explore my concerns, family, school before labeling me, acknowledge that I'm an individual and my story matters. A well-founded diagnosis can be validating, but premature labels cause lasting damage. Explain that the label is just one part of the bigger picture. That's not all you're going to do during the assessment. Life is hard, and instead of them dealing with it in a more holistic way, they just, they've just been put into this box. It's like a simple explanation for something that has many complexities. So next, um, we're going to look at positive change. Uh, how is it that a person can see themselves as contributing to positive change, even in a situation where they are in a crisis? And this, I think it's a key point in, in our examination of these videos and in our attempt to reconstruct what it means for the young person to preserve a sense of agency. Uh, what is it to affirm the capacity that the young person has to contribute to change? How does it translate in, in, um, in the communication? Acknowledge the past achievements, what the person has already done. Um, recognize multiple factors contributing to a crisis, something that we have just seen. For instance, acknowledging that you know, the young person is not responsible for what is happening to them. Emphasize feasible goals for the future. So identify things that the young person can strive to do and hope to be able to achieve and avoiding blaming the person. So um, the young people said practitioners should acknowledge that the young person's current state of distress is not their fault or a direct result of their action. But they should also encourage the young person and know that they have the inner strength and capacity to redirect and change their current circumstances, almost like a scaffolding approach. And I want to point out that this is a quote uh, from one of young, our young experts by experience. It's not a, a quote from an academic, but I find it incredibly inspiring. This idea of the scaffolding um, approach, especially, you know, that the capacity to take ownership of what is happening to you is something that you do with the other person, not by yourself. You do it, you know, together, you build it. Initially, we were thinking about using the notion of responsibility here, because the notion of responsibility in philosophy is central to agency. What an agent is, is someone who can take responsibility for what they do and uh, for what is going um, on in their lives and um, may also be um, someone that can give a direction to their future life. But we realized very quickly in conversation with our, our young experts, the responsibility was not the right concept here. And that's why we moved to affirmation of the capacity to contribute to change. Why is it? Already in the philosophical literature, on mental health, people have noticed that assigning responsibility may be problematic in a clinical context. So Anna Pickard, for instance, has developed the responsibility without blame framework. Anna Pickard is both a philosopher and someone who um, worked as a therapist in a community uh, of people with uh, diagnosis of personality disorder. And she noticed that in some situation, the practitioner needs to be able to assign the responsibility to the uh, uh, person with personality disorder. Otherwise, the person cannot take ownership of their treatment, cannot feel that they are actively participating in the recovery. At the same time, the practitioner shouldn't blame the person for what is happening to them because blaming is uh, detrimental to the therapeutic relationship. And it's not justified given that the person with 
um, personality disorders in many cases has had a history of abuse or difficult childhood and hasn't been able to learn how to behave in certain situations according to uh, certain uh, aspects of what we might call the moral character. So that's Anna Pickers' idea. She proposes maybe we should assign responsibility without blaming. But assigning responsibility without blaming is both theoretically and practically a very difficult thing to do. So other people in the literature have tried solutions that are a little bit different. Brandenburg and Stribus, for instance, have argued that we should probably go for the nurturing stance. What they mean by that is that, yes, we should um, assign responsibility to people when that's helpful and even blame them. But the blame is not a judgment about what was wrong with the past. It's an exhortation at changing things in the future. And they think that this is an attitude that is particularly helpful to adopt with young people who are still kind of developing in their identity and their agency and need a lot of support to be able to take responsibility for things. Both of these concepts for us were just too much. And the young people thought that the notion of responsibility was putting a huge burden on their shoulders. Um, so what is it that agents need to have? What type of capacities? One idea is to say that a young person needs the capacity to assume responsibility for what is happening to them, but that places an enormous burden on them. The other option is to say that a young person's capacity to contribute to change is what really matters, where that capacity is not something they have on their own, um, but they can be supported to acquire when they don't have it. And in a critical moment, it's quite sensible that they might not feel they have it because of the helplessness that we described earlier. So let's see this in more concrete terms in our next extract, which is about a practitioner recognizing the person's past achievement. Ron had overdosed many times in the previous year, but then started attending therapy and stopped overdosing as frequently. It's really hard to change things when you've got coping strategies or whatever it is. It's really, really hard to change it. And you've done really well to change. I saw you last year. I saw you a few times last year. Yeah. When you talk about your bad times, I, that's how I remember you. That's how I met you. And things are completely different for you now. Yeah. Yeah. I am doing better. I think you should be really proud of what we've done. A lot of people don't manage to do it. I think you've done really, really well. So here, um, there is a sense that the practitioner is recognizing the mental health journey of the person and is giving them the confidence to hope that they can continue to improve in the future. In next, oh, sorry, oh, you no, I was, I was just gonna mention this, this one in watching this case is, is quite amazing because here, this is a young girl who's just, or a young, young person who's just had a really large overdose. And so you would think that it would be really, in terms of the communication, that it would be quite difficult for a practitioner to come in and say, you know, I believe that you can contribute to change and this is why I believe that you're, you're doing well. Um, but she manages to do it. And again, in the, we, we don't show here, but in the post of the interview, that's the one thing that this young person remembers three months later. When we interviewed three months later, she says, well, this, this is, I don't remember much from that, but I remember that they were proud of me and proud of what I had achieved. So that clearly stayed with them. Um, so we have unfortunately exactly the opposite here. So we've got a young person who has attempted suicide um, and is being blamed for not considering the effect of their actions on other people. So John was found by his sister following an attempted suicide by overdose and brought to the hospital. So when you say you are concerned about the impact on other people, have you thought about what, what would happen for the people that found you? I, I had. I didn't want it to be my sister. Okay, but you said she was in the house at the time, so it could have been her. It could have been her, yeah. Okay, so again, the forensic style, um, the implication that, you know, they overdose um, in a situation where their sister could have found them, and they didn't consider the feelings of their sister in finding them, 
and the implication that everybody's feelings are more important than the person's feeling. So, it, you know, not even acknowledging that they must have felt so bad to attempt, you know, suicide. They should have actually put other people's feelings and needs um, before theirs. Um, and just no recognition of how difficult it must have been, basically. Um, there was a, I mean, I'm really happy again that we are enacting it because watching the video was extremely distressing. Um, just top tips for affirming the capacity to contribute to change. If I feel ashamed, I'm less inclined to share information about how I acted the way I did. So it's also from the point of view of the clinical performance really bad to behave in this way because you are preventing the young person from sharing information that you may need. It is important to acknowledge how far I have come. You don't want the message to be, it's not relevant how you're feeling, just imagine what these are due to everyone around you. Okay, class, it's you next. All right. I am going to be presenting on this last aspect of agency. So with, with adequate support, an agent can participate in decision-making. So again, um, like some of these past kind of the other aspects of agency that we've discussed, um, the young people really emphasize the role of the practitioner. So are you involving me in decisions? Um, I'll just start out with a quote from one of our young people. If the young person and practitioner don't have an open discussion about goals for treatment and the young person's preferences, they may end up working against each other throughout the duration of treatment and they make little to no progress. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, it was, I think the key here was a balance, a balance between not ignoring the person, but at the same time asking, you know, not also putting the burden on the person to make a decision themselves without the support that they might need in that moment. So it was a lot about asking for my perspective, explaining your perspective, and then being a team, agreeing on a plan together. So um, we have a case here where um, Luke Luke is experiencing suicidal thoughts. He was prescribed antidepressants, but stopped taking them after a few days because he started feeling very anxious. And I think for time, maybe I'll um, just speed through this one and point out that the practitioner is, is essentially treating Luke as already having what he needs to, um, sorry, I shouldn't step over there with everybody here. Um, what he, the tools that he needs to make a change for himself. She says, what do you need to start doing? And Luke says, taking tablets. And she says, you need to give it a go. So it's really this emphasis on, she has already decided what's gonna help him. She's not engaging with him on maybe why he is not taking the medication. In contrast, we have extract eight with Sam, also presenting after suicide attempt and his mother recently passed away. In this video, we're gonna see a more collaborative conversation about Sam's perspective on grief counseling. So she asks, she begins by asking any grief, have you had grief counseling in the past around loss of a family member? He says, no. She asks then if anyone had suggested it to her, to him and what he thinks about that. So the young people really um, emphasize that they, they believe that this one was a really good balance between um, a really good balance between not putting too much burden on the young person and also not unilaterally making a decision as a practitioner. And ultimately, yeah, yeah. Um, so there were some top tips, asking about concerns about treatment, being transparent about potential problems. And ultimately, here's our ladder. Key here, I think our take home message is that agency looked a little different to the young people in this context than we might have expected. So really the core, when the, when the young people were watching these videos, they were saying was validation, legitimization, avoidance of objectification. Without these, it would be really difficult for a practitioner to ultimately affirm the capacity to contribute to change or involve in decision-making in a meaningful way. Um, what we've learned, I think I'm, we're very excited, open to questions about this process. This was new for all of us, this kind of working, working with 
uh, practitioners, working with different people from different fields, working with young people. Um, yeah, we're really excited to, I think, share that in the Q&A. So we have open access articles, we have a podcast, definitely um, look us up online. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So brilliant. So we'll take uh, just a two minute uh, a break uh, for water and, and breathing and things like that. And then we'll start the Q&A. So, okay, I'm going to call that roughly uh, two minutes. So people in the uh, online chat, if you have a question, please put a cue in the chat and then I can let you ask the question in person or if you want me to read the question out for you, type your question. Um, so questions? Yeah, Harriet. Thank you so much. That was really cool. Um, so my question was about the, I think it's about the objectification case. So there was two comparisons of, um, two people who were suicidal, but in the one case, it was a case where they were trying to risk assess whether they were suicidal in the present and in the other one they were talking about uh, someone who had been suicidal in the past is that right because it just occurred to me that um with regards to the sort of uh, you know like adversarial kind of like forensic style that you were commenting on that um might be a lot harder to avoid the sort of forensic style in a case where you're trying to assess to risk assess whether this person's going to you know, uh, if, if this person is suicidal to the extent that they would end their life tonight. Um, and I was sort of wondering whether you had any, I mean, do you think that's sort of, you know, because why those kinds of questions are being asked and, and whether it's sort of there's special challenges in terms of avoiding that kind of style there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I would like to try to explain uh, the conversations that we had about being suicidal, but I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, there were lots of people with clinical experience in our team who are perfectly aware of the constraints of a risk assessment and you know the fact that ultimately you need to get certain bits of information out of the person um, in order to be able to advise on what to do and that it, it puts enormous constraints on the kind, of, the kind of conversation that you can have so we were aware of that um, and also in particular I think they were worried about the word suicidal being used differently but by different groups of people so maybe Claire, you can um yeah that. yeah i think i think we had a really wide range so um the young people watched a lot of different videos of a lot of different people and um the one thing that was consistent was that everyone had presented everyone who had presented in this context to the ed had either active thoughts of suicide or had just completed a suicide attempt that day or had um, uh, self-harmed potentially with suicidal thoughts. So I think, I think it was true that there was a very, like the clinical definition in this emergency context is very much around, are you at risk today? Are you at risk tomorrow? And it is, it is true that those looked different, those, those assessments tended to look different where a practitioner would be asking these, yeah, this more forensic style of questioning. I think what the young people really wanted to emphasize was that you don't need to adjust the risk assessment that much in order to incorporate those three first basic steps of validation, legitimization, and avoidance of objectification. So you can still ask questions like, um, right now in this moment, are you experiencing thoughts of suicide or do you have a plan to end your life? And you can respond to their answer in a way that is validating and legitimizing and it doesn't have to take a lot of time away and it doesn't have to change the trajectory of your questioning um i don't know if i answered your question <laughs> so we have a question in the chat um for a phd student looking at experience of menstrual menstrual disorder who compliments you and also wondered whether you recognized any kind of gender bias whereas patients identified as male were taken more seriously. 
That's a great question. Um, it, this was not something that we explored too much for this project specifically, but as someone who's watched kind of all of the videos that we've collected, <laughs> um, I think there definitely is, you definitely do see that bias. And you also see it in the formal risk assessments that are written up, which we also collected as part of the kind of data collection data analysis. So you do see, it's actually really interesting in the risk assessments, they will write mail as a risk factor. So you're seeing it kind of institutionally, it is part of that, it's, it's gonna be included in that risk assessment. And it's also that also, of course, is gonna be then reflected in the conversations. Yeah, and I think you also see um, certain types of attitudes changing, I think, in relation to uh, the perception of whether the person has support or is able to deal with the crisis by themselves. So we had a very striking case of the conversation with um, a girl who had eating disorder trouble. I mean, she thought she might have an eating disorder that was challenged by the practitioner. But one of the recommendations was, oh, maybe, you know, your boyfriend can sit with you when you're eating and encouraging you to eat. And you're thinking, mm, you know, I'm not sure that's the kind of advice that someone who didn't maybe look or present like her would have got. So I think you definitely see biases across the spectrum. Um, and what we want to investigate next is exactly how these kind of associations with different aspects of the person's identity, sexuality, gender, um, are going to relate to the other uh, um, kind yeah. of attitudes that we have already met. Yeah. There's, there's also a question from Kim. So Kim, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm a um, uh, student at the University of Bergen in Norway, and I'm writing my master thesis on if conversion therapy should be outlawed in, in liberal states. And so I, I, I've heard, for, I've read quite a lot from the medical community about the LGBT community being very vulnerable, uh, a very vulnerable group, especially uh, the youth. And so it is, um, and it's also, there, there is a lot of critique against the term therapy because it's considered fraud and it's also um, only harm and no benefit. And so I have, um, so I have a little bit of thoughts about how you would approach a youth that wants to convert because their family uh, don't accept them for who they are. And so would you, would you tell them, for example, to embrace who they are if they, if they have problems uh, with their, if the result will be that they will have problems with their family or get kicked out of their home or anything like that? Um, so basically, my question is, what do you think about youths that feel like they have to change and convert. Yeah, okay, so first maybe we should say that there are research projects that look specifically at this kind of uh, situation. For instance, I know at the Institute for Mental Health in Birmingham, um, you know, there are people who are looking at self-harm um, that may come in, in this type of context, and we haven't specifically looked at that. But one thing that may be more helpful for us to say at this stage is that we think that the agential stance, what we call that letter that we have presented at the end, may work in a variety of contexts. So we have looked at that communication between practitioners and young people in distress. But you know, what about parents and children? What about teachers and pupils? I mean, I really feel that all those things that we've talked about, those five themes, really apply to a lot of relationships where there is a power imbalance. You know, validation and legitimizations are always, I think, really good steps to take on. So I'm thinking, you know, you talked about parents who have maybe um, a young person in their family who doesn't feel comfortable with their sexuality. Then I think, again, you know, maybe they should go through those steps as well. You know, I'm not saying you always have to accept everything that the other person says is true, but you need to go through the steps of validation and legitimization. And, and, and I'm thinking, you know, the, now that we've got the agenda stance, I see it everywhere. <laughs> and, and, but it, it, I, I think, you know, it, it's not unique to the specific context in which we described, although we are only confident to talk about that context, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. and I think the only other thing that I would add is, is 
that we had a really good experience in our research with, I mean, I guess what you would call really traditionally vulnerable group of, of people. So young people who have experienced mental health treatment and in doing this kind of this research where we have a group of academics, professionals, and a group of young people, part of the reason that we didn't actually put those two groups together in the data analysis, in the kind of, it, is because it was really clear from the young people that they did not want to be in a room with a lot of academics or clinicians, and they wouldn't be willing to share their stories in that context. And so I think when you're working with a really vulnerable population, I guess that would be my one piece of advice going forward with the PhD is, you know, really looking for the literature on how you can make young people feel safe when you're having these kinds of conversations about these really sensitive and triggering topics in research. So like when you're asking them these sorts of questions, there is a lot of research into kind of what helps, what helps young people feel safe and leave a research setting feeling okay and not triggered. And um, yeah, so happy to speak with you about that more at a later time, but I am sorry that I can't speak directly to your question. Okay, uh, is that a question for the room? Otherwise we've got another question from the online audience. Yeah, please one for the room. Um, I know you said that you had some data in adults as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have analysed it, but if you have, I was just wondering if you found exactly the same, because I can imagine the sort of dynamic is different adult to adult than adult to child, um, or maybe it's the same. There was actually more in validation. I personally, I mean, we haven't looked at it, you know, coded and counted this, but but kind of my sense from watching the videos is there is more of this invalidation and delegitimization for the young people. So especially young people coming in who, to your point, haven't yet self-harmed, in particular that group. So people coming in saying, I have suicidal thoughts, but I haven't acted on them. And in those cases, you do get, and so I wasn't surprised when our YLER really emphasized kind of this, this invalidating stance that practitioners were taking as kind of a core of some of this, some of these issues around agency, because it's not something you see as much if it's, say, an adult with a, you know, 30-year history of suicide attempts. They're going to be kind of taken a lot more seriously in the conversation. Um, yeah, there is also something that I think is, I found personally very interesting because I work with, you know, university students, I'm an academic, so a lot of the people um, using these emergency um, services were students sent by the university yeah. support uh, services to emergency department because they thought you know there was a situation that uh, the university couldn't deal with and you saw these incredibly articulate young people explaining you know what this situation was how they were feeling and immediately you could see the the the, the, the reaction of the practitioner um, very often quite explicitly was yes. to say, you seem okay to me, you know, yes. if you're so articulate, you know, you can explain what yes. the problem is so well, and you know exactly what is happening, and you know, you know, you almost see that uh, being articulate, being able to express yes. yourself in a certain way is taken to be evidence that there is no need of further support. Yes. And I don't think you'd yes. see that as much in an adult population, it might happen. Um, but I think it was particularly relevant to yes. this population, yes. this age group. It's a question in the audience from Astrid Fly-Oritsen. If you want to unmute and ask your question. Sorry, yeah, um, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm a PhD student working on borderline personality disorder and moral agency at the moment, and epistemic injustice, and I'm just thinking about whether you saw anything regarding yeah so you mentioned now like history of prior suicide attempts and self-harm uh, but whether that sort of and I guess it might be more relevant in the adult population but whether there is any kind of like if that changed the style of communication so I really like the idea of like thinking of it as a forensic style uh, way and I recognize that myself uh, and then also like 
again, I'm, I'm sort of, I have personal interest here regarding like specific diagnoses, right? Um, but yeah, yeah, really interesting project. Thanks. Thank you. I love that question. Is it okay if I, yeah. it? <laughs> if I start? <laughs> because we are actually, we're working on multiple other papers kind of relating to some of these themes that you brought up right now. So, um, and some of them with the young people that we've worked with for this project as well. So there is, it's, it's almost like a bell curve, you know, <laughs> where you get, you know, if someone has not, um, has not self-harmed, you get a certain style of interaction. If someone has self-harmed, but doesn't have a pattern of repeating self-harm monthly or something like that, for example, you have another style of interaction. And then there's a very specific style of interaction for people who are presenting more frequently than maybe say twice a year. So um, we, we don't here, we don't necessarily, and I'm sure you would know this as well in your research, we don't necessarily have like formal diagnosis of BPD in the medical records or anything like that. Um, but you definitely get the practitioners talking about, you know, who might have BPD, you get the, this like very, very different style of communication, a lot of um, real like minimization coming up with lots of reasons why a person trying to convince a person that they should not be pursuing further intervention from services. Um, very happy to speak with you. If you want to email me, we, um, we're we working on projects. We're specifically writing a paper together with Lisa now on epistemic agency in these assessments, as well as a project on when a person has uh, is also experiencing um, uh, alcohol misuse. And that has a lot of overlap with um, what, you know, with repeat presentation. So um, yeah, so I think there's a lot there. I think I'm glad you're doing your PhD on this subject because I think it's, it's, there's a lot to be said. Yeah, thank you. I'll write an email. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We have a question from Dr. Puvesh Padani, which is certainly also mispronounced. When we talk about mental disorders, especially serious ones, is it unusual to expect agency to be affected due to the disorder itself. So maybe the most appropriate way of increasing agency is to first robustly assess for the presence of said disorder and then treat. This is not to take away from the overarching message of good skillful communication. Oh, okay, that's um, a really difficult question to answer in a brief time, but um, we definitely have thought about this. So uh, one of the concepts that we started with was precisely the concept of uh, epistemic injustice that uh, our previous um, uh, participants mentioned. So we thought in terms of, is there a situation where what the person has to say is dismissed because the person presents in a certain way? And we thought that youth may interfere with other factors or maybe be layered with other factors. And initially, actually the first um, disorder or let's say symptomatology that we were thinking about was psychosis. So we were thinking because of the expertise of some people in the, in the group, what about the young people who have the first psychotic episode, for instance, or hallucinations of delusions for the first time. Now, uh, the idea that uh, philosophers sometimes uh, uh, put forward is that you cannot really be thinking of agency or you cannot really be thinking about epistemic injustice in a population where uh, you know there is a disorder of that type where there is uh, because there are psychotic symptoms because the idea is the person doesn't have rationality doesn't uh, represent reality accurately you cannot really be um, in unjust well, unjust when uh, you don't take what they say seriously because if you were to take what they say seriously, you'd um, not accept you know, that they have a certain type of disorder. So I find that kind of approach very uh, difficult um, to, to say the least. I think that even in people, young people or adults who have um, psychotic symptoms, there is no impairment of rationality that is global or that affects all of their thinking. Um, even if there were some impairments of rationality, which I think all need to be uh, demonstrated, that wouldn't necessarily affect agency. And indeed, we wanted to build, so we didn't look at that population here. We are looking at more kind of mood issues, self-harm and suicide and low mood. Um, but uh, the kind of notion of agency that we wanted to build 
with a notion of agency, which was psychologically realistic. We are not thinking about the ideal agent who has everything worked out and can solve everything by themselves, because none of us is like that, whether we have a diagnosis or not. We're thinking about a notion of agency that works for us in situations where we might not feel in control simply because we don't happen to be in control and we need to negotiate with other people. And so what we were thinking is, both for your own well-being, your own sense of identity and your clinical outcomes is a very good idea if other people treat you as an agent. Now, how much agency you actually have in that specific moment is very difficult to assess. You might not have very much because of those, you know, critical moments that you are experiencing. But the fact that the other people treat you as if you can be an agent and support you in, order, in your decision making and your sense of you know, taking ownership of what you need to do moving forward is really important. Thank you. Just looking at the room. Otherwise, there's a question from Paul Fletcher. Paul, do you want to unmute and fire off? Hello there, thank you for a, a, a fantastic presentation. Um, what I'd like to ask is, um, are there any conversational methods of developing rapport quickly that you have discovered during your research? And um, also, um, regarding the uh, agency question, would you say to give the person more autonomy is a way of, and developing options is a way of, is a way of moving forward with that. And how would you assess that balance between the person and the practitioner of allowing them a certain amount of autonomy in the thinking if they're in desperate situations? Thank you. You want to do that for one and I'll do yes. the autonomy. One. Sounds good. <laughs> um, I think so. A lot of the research that we do, um, I'm part of a team at City University of London, Division of Health Services Research and Management run by Professor Rose McCabe. And we do a lot of work into specifically that, um, you know, how is it that practitioners can develop trust, rapport and in these really like critical crisis situations. And um, feel free to, let, I'll, um, maybe I can add to the chat. We've uh, actually just put up a new website called Talking About Mental Health, T-A-M-H.co.uk, where we talk about certain, we have short videos and things with recommendations for how practitioners can help develop trust in a setting where they're talking about really sensitive mental health issues such as suicide. Um, but we do, I mean, really in, in the basic sense, we often say start with narrative interviewing, which is kind of a technique around um, asking really open questions and not transitioning initially into risk assessment, really focusing on the person's story and demonstrating understanding and acceptance of where they are at that moment. And that being a really good, um, a really important starting block in order for other conversational tactics, other communication tactics to be effective later. Um, I might leave it there because I'll ask you guys to look on the website and yeah. hand over to Lisa. Now the question about autonomy, it's a really, really interesting one. And uh, it's kind of related to the question about agency that we had earlier. So initially, of course, we were starting with the big concept. So we started with the systemic injustice and with autonomous agency. Um, but then we moved towards a kind of different framework. Um, I mean, it's not that autonomy is not important. And I think it's definitely of great interest to people participating in this series on the mental health path. Um, but we thought uh, even of autonomy in a kind of relational way. So we were thinking about how the practitioner can enable the young person to do things that the young person wouldn't have been able to do by themselves, given the difficult situations in which we were. One thing that we noticed is that the young people were extremely understanding of the constraints that are imposed on practitioners in this context. And that's why in the end, uh, they said all we ask for is validation really yeah <laughs> just listen just listen yeah. to what we have to say at the same time they were also very vocal about not wanting the all responsibility of the success of the interaction on their own shoulders yeah. they don't want to be asked what's the best support for you because yeah. they may not be able to answer that question at that moment or even ever they are not the experts in the room when it comes to what is the support available they are the expert in the room when it comes to what it is that they are experiencing and that is incredibly important, but they need help at all steps so they can make decisions.
intelligence together with the practitioner in a collaborative way. And we can even talk to that, you know, talk about them as autonomous decisions, as long as we understand autonomy, not in the sense that, you know, they are by themselves deciding what shape their life should take. Um, but in the sense that they are considering all the relevant factors and they're being guided by the practitioner in going step after step, trial after trial, until they find what works for them. Yeah. There's a, there's a question in the room from Rivka. Um, I think it's for the online. Is that working? Yeah. And yes. cool. um, thank you. This is really interesting. And my question kind of, I think, nicely follows on from this, uh, uh, your answer just then. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about the application of this, because I think it's, you know, the kind of incorporation of patient experience into the way that we change, try and change healthcare. It's so important, very clearly, like it's such great work. But so what does it mean for the clinicians and what we expect from clinicians? And um, because with a lot of the cases that you uh, showed us, it kind of struck me that some of the people just sound like they're kind of, excuse my language, assholes. Like, you know what I mean? Like when you have a conversation with loads of people about any kind of emotional distress, some people are just really bad at communicating with you and other people are really good and show empathy and have empathy and, you know, kind of theory of mind and caringness. And so what do we, and I, I think there's a skill in that ability to communicate that, but also a natural disposition. So I kind of just wonder with, the application of what we want from clinicians is this we need to select clinicians better is this we need to find some really impressive way of developing these skills uh or like training clinicians to develop this really rich yeah. potentially innate skill um, and then a kind of side question is just did you see that there was any it seems like there was like a lot of unanimous uh unanimously the young people seem to think that validation is really important but did you see kind of disparity in what young people wanted in terms of decision making or what the clinician's role would be in deciding treatment pathways or how much incorporation they want in that because I find often in other fields of healthcare there's a lot of disparity in what people want and some people want their clinician to just say I'm going to do this this is what's best and others want to be incredibly involved and then how do you manage that so yeah. communication skills very important but then how do you manage these disparities. Yeah. So Clara is the expert on communication, so I'll leave it to her in a second. I just want to say my lay person in two cents about, about your first question. So, you know, there are people who are natural teachers, there are people who are natural parents, there are people who are natural kind of practitioners. They just, it comes easy to them to communicate in such a way that makes the relationship immediately kind of successful. That doesn't mean that all of us can learn how to be better. So I think that you know the importance of this kind of work, getting tips from the young people who had these experiences to the practitioners, is that even people for whom this thing is not natural, it doesn't come natural, or maybe they don't show empathy as much just because of you know culture or the way they talk or the way they are, um, even they following these tips can improve in their communication techniques. So for me, that's the message, but that's just a very first thing. No, 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 I, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, I think that's really true. I think another kind of key point is it isn't just all, you know, I mean, I think it, it, there's so much clinician burnout. So especially in this role where they're working nights, they're working 12 hour shifts, they're not getting supervision, they're not getting paid well. And, you have these like strict time limits. And so I think a lot of this kind of what we see as problematic communication comes from burnout and just this inability to see, I mean, they're literally going one patient to the next one hour at a time for 12 hours. <laughs> and so I think what we've heard, so we've run trainings before, not specifically here, but for other projects that Professor McCabe has run, and we are actually, we're in the process now of trying to figure out how to help liaison, psychiatric liaison practitioners with communication because in a context in which it's so hard to like remember, you know, remember tips and tricks like this. And I think what the young people and like kind of like Lisa said, um, points that are really important is that it can just be getting used to a slightly different way of communicating and responding. So in particular, how to respond to answers to questions. So 
um, what we have been trying to do in the training is really giving, you know, doing a lot of role play and stuff like that to give people a little bit of experience thinking like, well, what if I don't ask question after question after question? And what if, like, what if I try adding a couple of words, two, three words, just in response to what a person answers, how does that feel? Can I remember to do that every time? Um, so I think it's a very open question and it's a really important question. So if people here have advice for us, this is an ongoing kind of, <laughs> it's an ongoing issue. Um, second yeah, and, and also, you know, a lot is non-verbal, um, as, yes. as Clara and yeah. Rose have taught me. So a lot is, you know, looking at the person when you talk to them rather than, you know, looking at the piece of paper where you're taking notes or kind of, even just, you know, the, the posture, like, oh, you're sitting on the chair. And, you know, the young people notice every little detail. Yeah. You know, they, they remember their experiences mm -hmm. while looking at these videos. And it's amazing, like, everything matters. Um, which doesn't mean that we need to be perfect, you know, but it just means that sometimes it's not a question of having more time available. It's just using the time slightly differently. Um, I, I don't remember what was it. Could you remind us of your second question? I mean, it's fine, not perfect. Just about like whether there were disparities. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, so, that. so just, just before coming here, Clara and I had coffee together, and I was telling her that a few years ago, with a, a postdoctoral researcher working um, on, on a project with me, Sophie Summers, what we did was a brief, a brief policy, so a policy brief uh, looking at um, mental capacity. And we went around the city interviewing people like nurses and uh, mental health lawyers, practitioners, uh, patient groups. And one thing they came back consistently was that we tend to assume that people want decision power. That's not what they want. Consistently, what they're saying is that putting the burden of the choice on them when they don't have all the resources to be um, able to make those choices. Uh, is felt as a burden, is, is felt as an attempt by the practitioner to shift the burden and to avoid further trouble down the line in terms of being sued or whatever. So the perception was we tend to assume that they want decision power, but that's not necessarily what they want. Uh, what they want, I assume, uh, at least from what I heard, and then it's just you know, one case, and then I'm sure there is diversity in other contexts, is this kind of collaborative approach. Let's find the best solution together. You tell me what your experiences were, because I'm not going to prescribe again a treatment that was unsuccessful that you couldn't cope with. Um, tell me what was your experience on the basis of that. I'm making a suggestion and you tell me what to think. So that is my, you know, the message that I got from that experience, but it's very limited experience that most of this story. There could be diversity in other places. And just to like very briefly add on to what you just said here, I think that it, my experience doing these data sessions with the young people, what we're seeing right now in practice is extremes and not a lot of really kind of new, nuanced balance of decision making. So there's a lot of like, there's a lot of the questions that are asked are, are required. So the liaison practitioner has to ask certain questions. So in all these assessments, for example, we would have one early question is typically, what do you think is gonna help you? But these questions are coming in way before there's any conversation about treatment options, anything like that. So, you know, you get these kind of extremes of, you know, you get that, and then on the other hand, you'll get people who are, you know, coming in at the end, like the like the example we saw here, saying, "Well, the medication, you know, what you need to do, you need to be taking your medication." And I think the one universal thing that the young people were saying, and that I wouldn't be surprised is, is at least somewhat universal in in contexts like this, is that young people wanted the practitioner to ask them what they thought about the specific treatment options that the practitioner was considering recommending. So if the practitioner was considering recommending medication, they wanted that practitioner before they made that recommendation, went ahead and made that recommendation, they wanted them to ask what their experiences and perspectives were about that. So it's, a, you know, in that context, it's quite a simple change, but um, 
Yeah, so I think it's choice yeah. within limits. Yeah, rather than yeah. <laughs> kind of random choice. Exactly. Um, exactly. Choice knowing what the options are rather yeah. than. So it's a couple of questions. So there's a question whether this is written up. There's a question whether you are researching other groups of uh, patients, people with learning disability uh, and mental health, whether you are looking at ward team staff culture and how that influences kind of attitudes and tone. Uh, so good news first. I thought yeah. these might be relatively quick questions, yes. right? not requiring long terms of no, 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 okay, yes. okay, okay, Sorry, I'll be quick. So the paper is written, has been accepted for publication. It's not no. out yet, yeah. but it will be out open access very, yes. very soon. Yeah, so that's the good news. Yeah, and we have a number of other publications kind of that we're working on as a team now. And like I talked about the epistemic injustice paper and a paper on um, how alcohol use factors into this. And I think we are hoping that this is kind of the first of a series of we've also applied for a new grant yeah. recently to keep funding this kind of research so we're hoping that this is just the beginning of yeah. looking at different populations and groups and and if someone wants something that is more like training resources for practitioners we have done sessions with the mental health which are available on youtube on oh, all yeah. of these yeah. aspects of the agential ladder so again that's one place to look for. as well as the podcast actually which yeah. um we should We'll make sure to link the podcast as well, um, which was carried out by the McPin Foundation and in like features a lot of the young people and their voices, um, who, who the people who were participating in the project themselves. Can I squeeze in a question myself? Yes. yes. <laughs> 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 um, so I just I was so I was struck. I, I, I don't do much of this way, but I have a sightline in, in birth autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. And I was really struck. It's obviously a completely different domain. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not mental health. Uh, it's not even disease. It's people giving birth. Although, you know, the high rates of high rates of birth trauma and notably high rates of birth trauma, uh, about half of that is due to the communication, not to the, you know, mm -hmm. mortal blood or something. So, um, and I was just so struck by the narratives I hear there and how they map on to you know, the lack of validation, not involving in decision making, kind of all these kind of things. So I'm kind of wondering whether you have any have any thoughts sort of beyond mental health, you know, in just a wider kind of medical institution for these phenomena. Because the flip side, kind of the things that you recommend, you know, I think to any normal human being, kind of sound, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to talk to my kids and I'm trying to talk to my students. You know, these all sounds like sensible advice. Um, but which I don't say to belittle. I mean, it's no, good, no, you no. know, we can recognize the good things human communicators. There's actually a probably, you know, huge rooms of medicine that would benefit yeah. from that. Are you doing any research? No, I, I, on think the that, I think that's a wonderful example of an area of application because I think where, I mean, this is common sense, right? Um, the agential ladder is common sense, but you do find that you need to tell people what the common sense is when there are these situations where one person is probably temporarily in a situation where they are powerless or maybe just simply because they need someone else to give them the support that, you know, at that moment is essential for them to complete what they need to do. So for the young person is, I am in a crisis, tell me what to do. You know, I have suicidal thoughts, you know, what can I do? For the woman who's giving birth, it's like, you know, they can be the most articulate people in the world, but in that moment, they need help. Um, and they need to communicate what, what they want, and they need to be able to be listened to, and they are not, and we know that they are not. <laughs> um, so that, that is a huge, huge area, I think. And so I think there are strong, you know, it's not mental health, but I think there are strong parallels. And I think there are some parallels for lots of interesting reasons that sometimes, you know, the woman at the moment of um, delivery is not considered fully in, in, the, in her best um, capacities or fully lucid. Um, and, and, and it's perfectly possible that, you know, in that situation, you need to remind people what the agential ladder looks like. So we haven't done it, obviously, that's the short answer, but I think the application is very obvious. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that struck me particularly is we did a qualitative analysis of negative birth experiences, and the thing that kind of comes out is something like, yeah, go for it. 
oh, is powerlessness is kind of the overarching way that women felt who yeah. sell for 40 seconds of birth experiences. And a lot of that seems to come from the communication styles rather than the actual, um, ultimately, you know, than the actual birth making you feel powerless. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what kind of triggered it. Okay, well, we there's a couple of more things in the chat. I think the podcast has been reposted. Repost but we are out of time. So yeah, please people unmute their microphone and join me in uh, thanking you both for, you know, wonderful Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.